Watch says it's six o'clock, so I will call the September 30 meeting of the Bastrop Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Please call the roll. Debbie Moore. Here. Cynthia Meyer. Cheryl Lee. Present. Ishmael Harris. Here. Pablo Serna. Here. And Matt Lawson and Greg Sherry will not be with us tonight. Thank you. We do have a quorum, so we will move on to citizen comments. Do we have any citizen comments? Not at this time. Not at this time. Okay. Then we'll move on to item three, items for individual consideration. Item 3A, consider action to approve meeting minutes from the August 26, 2021 Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting. Every, it's been sent out to everyone. Everyone's had a time to look at it. Uh, are there any additions, corrections, or deletions? If not, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please let the record indicate that it passed unanimously. Item 3B, consider action to approve the Bastrop Grove Section 4, Phase 1A, final plat being 15.201 acres out of the Nancy Blakey survey, abstract number 98, located south of Agnes Street and east of State Highway 304 within the city limits of Bastrop, Texas, as shown in Exhibit A. Ms. Allison Lamb, would you please explain to us what's going on here? Yes, ma'am, good evening. Thank you. All right, so this development is south of Agnes Street, east of 304, across the street from Hunter's Crossing. All right, this is part of a plan development district um, that was adopted right before the B3 code, um, but it did try to incorporate the general intent of that code with the gridded streets as much as possible um, and these smaller blocks. Uh, so this is the half of the northern section of that plan development. Uh, the LCRA transmission line bisects this large piece of property, um, and so this is on the northern side of that. It is zoned plan development district. The future land use is transitional residential, which calls for um, single family and high density single family and um, mm -hmm. starts to get into your multi-family um, residential products. Uh, City of Bastrop will provide water and wastewater and Blue Bonnet will be the electric provider. It is 15, a little over 15 acres. They're proposing 75 residential lots and three open space lots. Um, the lots will be anywhere from 35 to 50 feet wide. And those 35 foot lots are alley loaded products. Um, and so there, there will be a couple alleys in addition to those streets. Um, there are five local streets and one arterial and that is Greenleaf Fisk Drive. Um, and that will be the extension from Hunter's Point Drive all the way east across the property. Stormwater in this development drains east into the uh, large channel on the eastern boundary. All right. So here is the overall picture of the entire plot. Um, there are two entrances onto 304 that feed into this area, um, local streets. That southern street that you see on 304, that's the extension of Greenleaf Fisk um, that will continue all the way through the development as an arterial street. Um, the, then you'll have, you know, your small blocks there. Um, the connection to Agnes, uh, there's actually a little bit of a gap between that right of way and the existing Agnes right of way. So that one's not connecting at this time, uh, but will in the future. And here is a zoomed in section of the actual, um, housing area. Uh, so as you can see those, the smaller lots front on Smallmouth Road, so they'll look out over uh, what's going to be green space under the easement, um, and then your, your other residential products behind those. And we recommend approval. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner, do you have any questions of Ms. Lamb? No, just I just remember this project has gone through a number of stages and uh, really 
it's really come a long way. It's looking, even though we, like you said, it was before we actually enacted our B3 code, it's a really good representation of what we're trying to achieve. So I, I move to uh, recommend we approve as noted on the plan. Second. Motion and a second. Would you please call the roll? Pablo Serna? Yes. Cynthia Myers? Yes. Debbie Moore? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Ishmael Harris? Yes. Thank you. Please let the record indicate it's passed unanimously. Item 3B, consider action to approve the Bastrop Grove Section 4, Phase 1, Final Plat, being 15.201 acre. Oops, we just did that one. <laughs> I thought it sounded familiar. Item, three, item 3C, <laughs> consider action to approve the Bastrop Grove Section 4, Section 1B, Final Plat, being 14.128 acres out of the Nancy Bakey survey. Abstract number 98, located south of Agnes Street and east of State Highway 304, within the city limits of Bass Drop, Texas, as shown in Exhibit A. All right, so this is the eastern portion of the portion of that de same development um, north of the LCRA easement. All right, so this one takes access through uh, Section 1A um, with the extension of local streets there. Uh, this is the area of the concept plan in that plan development district that it covers. Um, and you can see on the very right hand side of that image is the large drainage channel where everything drains to. All right. um, same information, same service, same development, same future land use. All right. This one is 14.218 acres and it will be 73 lots residential lots um, with one open space park slash drainage lot. Um, that average size is incorrect. Ignore that, please. Um, these will also be 35 to 50 foot wide uh, lots, just like the, the previous section. Um, there will be six local streets and the stormwater drains east to that channel. Okay. And there's a, the picture of the plot. Um, you know, Cattail Lane extends over towards 304 through the other development. Small Mouth Road on the south there um, connects into the other side as well. Um, and then we have, we'll see if that does not work. Okay. Um, in the lower right hand corner is where uh, that green space um, future park drainage area is. Is it safe to say that someone who likes fishing named these streets? Yes, okay. they are all fish themed. All fish names. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and we recommend approval. Okay. Staff recommends approval. Is there any question of any council, a uh, commission member? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Is there a second? A second. Second. Motion and second. Would you please call the roll? Yes. Pablo Serna. Yes. Ismail Harris. Yes. Debbie Moore. Yes. Cynthia Meyer. Yes. Cheryl Lee. Yes. Please let the uh, records reflect. Ms. Carey has joined us today. Thank you. Pardon my tardiness. You're excused. That time of day. Uh, item 3D, consider action to approve the Colony Mud 1D Section 1 Phase B Final Plat being 30.654 acres out of the Jose Manuel Bangs survey, abstract number five, located north of Sam Houston Drive and extending Dorst Lane within the extraterritorial jurisdiction of Bastrop, Texas, as shown in Exhibit A. All right. Okay. So this section in the colony is closer towards the older portion of the colony, um, but still within the mud. Uh, this is the second phase of one of their sections. Uh, the stormwater infrastructure was actually installed earlier and they are finishing it out. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's on the portion of Sam Houston that you access from the original part of the colony. Not, doesn't quite connect to 969 yet. All right. And so eventually Sam Houston will connect all the way through that southern arm, um, but we're kind of in what I'll call the elbow of the colony mud. 
Right, this is statutory ETJ. Um, future land use is neighborhood residential, which single family lots do allow for. Uh, it's proposing seven, 57 residential lots, six non-residential lots. Those are landscape drainage easements, easement lots. Um, four local streets, and it drains to an existing pond in the southeast. All right, so uh, to make this fit on the slide, I did rotate it. <laughs> that way you can actually see what it is a little bit. Um, but the in the right-hand top side of the slide there, that is the drainage pond. Um, and we extend uh, Darst Lane already connects to Sam Houston, and then there are local streets off of that. And we do recommend approval. Commissioners, are there any, are there any questions? Motion mm -hmm. to approve. Second. Motion and second. We please call the roll. Carrie Taylor. Aye. Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Debbie Moore? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Ismael Harris? Yes. Pablo Serna? <clears throat> yes. Please let the record reflect passed unanimously. Item 3D, consider action to approve Colony Mud 1C Section 2 Final Plat being 21.604 acres out of the Jose Manuel Bang Survey Abstract Number 5 located north of Sam Houston Drive within the extraterritorial jurisdiction of Bastrop, Texas, is shown in Exhibit A. All right. So this section extends Sam Houston Drive towards 969 um, in that southern arm of the colony. And this is as they work their way west from 969. Um, all right, so this is also statutory ETJ. Um, neighborhood residential, they are proposing 61 residential lots, three non-residential lots. Uh, there will be four local streets, um, an extension of Sam Houston Drive, and there will be one local connector to the development to the south. Um, the drainage in this section goes to a pond in the east and then outfalls to the south to their um, drainage easement that runs along the southern border of their property. So here's the picture. As you can see, it extends Sam Houston a little bit, and then you have some local connectors that go into the development, and it will connect to the section to the west. Um, and then um, there is also that north-south connector uh, that will provide connectivity through the colony to the developments to the south. And staff recommends approval. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, on that connector to the south, what uh, that that kind of came up in one of the previous meetings. I mean, that's all that you're working that out with those particular developers. Yes. Okay. Yes. So they will uh, match up their plans right. so that those connect, um, and it will be there is an agreement with the colony and the county and the city on when that road gets connected and when that development to the south gets to that portion. Right. Um, they will build this section. And that helps with the traffic. And that helps. Able. Yes, that helps with general traffic, gives more people, gives people a few more ways out um, of their developments and delaying the construction until the uh, section to the south gets there protects that roadway from deteriorating um, in advance of its normal life. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, I'll consider motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Carrie Taylor? Yes. Debbie Moore? Yes. Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Ismael Harris? Yes. Pablo Serna? Yes. Motion approved unanimously. All right, that was, we go to, was that E or D? That was D. D. That was D. Okay. Item 3E, consider action to approve the Colony Mud 1C Section 2. Final plat being 21.604 acres out of the Jose Manuel Bang survey. Abstract number five, located north of Sam Houston Drive within the extraterritorial jurisdiction of Bastrop, Texas, as shown in Exhibit A. I believe that's the one we just did. That's the one we just had. That's what I thought. <laughs> we just did E. Okay, so now we're on would have been D and 
Um, they all sound alike. I'm sorry. They do. They do. <laughs> okay, we're on item 3F. We hold a public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of the Forum Street Village zoning concept scheme, changing the zoning for 15.824 acres out of Forum Lot 37 East of Main Street, located at 1500 Forum Street, from P3 neighborhood to P4 mix within the city limits of Bastrop, Texas. Okay, so the request for this development is to go from P3 neighborhood, which is our uh, typically our single family housing um, or duplex zoning, to P4 mix, which allows a greater variety of um, housing types. Uh, they, they are proposing a traditional neighborhood, pat neighborhood development pattern, um, which is essentially maintaining the historic block structure that you see through the rest of downtown Bastrop. So those are your farm lot structures, which are your 720 foot block face, um, larger blocks, and your building blocks, which are your 330 foot long blocks. So that's what you see around City Hall here. All right, this property is north of Farm Street, um, south of Cedar Street, and it is, runs parallel to Gills Branch. Um, which parallels State Highway 95, um, and it is proposing the extension of Chambers Street between Farm and Cedar. Um, so this property is actually two farm lots. Okay, so you see the Pack Center is in the northern, um, on your, that's the northwest quadrant of that kind of that area, um, and then you have a farm lot in that area to the east, and then halfway down is kind of the, um, where you start another farm lot. So it's not quite two farm lots since the creek divides part of it, um, but that is the area that we're looking at. All right, so they are going to extend Chamber Street between Farm and Cedar. Uh, that would be a publicly dedicated right-of-way, um, public street with on-street parallel parking. Uh, they are proposing three drive aisles off of chambers into the development. Um, there will be a drive aisle that runs parallel to the new chamber street that matches up with a 330 block grid, right? Um, and that will create the form of four building blocks. And I have a picture to illustrate this. Just bear with me for a second. All right. Uh, there will be additional lots on the other side of that parallel drive aisle for a clubhouse amenities and publicly dedicated open space along Gills Branch. So what that looks like, and this one I also rotated so that we could see the picture better. Um, so north is to the left. Uh, the street on the far left is Cedar Street. Um, so we will be extending from farm to Cedar um, with Chambers, which is the street on the bottom of the slide there. Uh, we also have a parallel um, drive aisle between farm and Cedar and that is just shy. I think it's about 285 feet to the center line of that. Um, keep in mind our normal block structure is about 330 feet. So it's a little little smaller, but that's okay. Um, when you say drive aisle, what does that mean? Yes, so if this were to fully meet the letter of the B3 code, all of these drive aisles shown here creating this gridded network would be publicly dedicated right of way. Due to the funding nature of this development, um, it is proposed to be apartments. Um, they cannot have multiple parcels, and so they are proposing to have non-vehicular access easements laid over all of these drive aisles so that you can maintain pedestrian connectivity, um, but it doesn't create different parcels for their financing. Okay. Um, so as you can see, they create the, a similar pattern of four blocks, um, and then you have your parallel drive aisle uh, that completes that row of blocks. There will be a pedestrian trail towards Gills Branch where they will publicly dedicate civic space. Uh, that gives the city room to do Gills Branch improve, drainage improvements um, as needed and as funding is available in the future. Um, 
The proposed building type, as I mentioned, is apartments, uh, which are buildings greater than five units. They are oriented towards chambers, um, and parking will be located between the buildings and Gills Branch, as you can see in the diagram. You have the you have Chamber Street, your row of buildings, your streets in, and your parking, and then Gills Branch. All right, here's another image. Um, Chamber Street will be a public street. They're going to follow the street cross sections, uh, which does include a, their pr proportional share is half of that street. So they'll have one travel lane. It'll be a one-way road going from farm to cedar um, with parallel on-street parking. And then you'll also have sidewalk and street trees. Uh, they're also proposing sidewalks along the drive aisles um, to make the blocks um, and down the, the longer other parallel street between farm and cedar. That way it maintains the look and feel of a public street, even though it won't be. What's the flex space? The flex space, those are two lots on the end uh, that they do not propose on developing at this point in time. Uh, if those were to develop, they would need to come in with all of their own development plans. Okay. How many uh, occupants are they expecting to have here? It's proposed to be 120 units. 120 units, mm -hmm. so an average of three people a unit, I guess? Or? I think it's a mix of one and two, are okay. there three? Okay. One, two, and three bedroom units. Okay. Um, is the park dedicated land, is that a requirement for this uh, development? There is a civic space, so we look at pedestrian sheds, so the area, um, and we look at the allocation of different place Explain types. Explain the pedestrian shed, please, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So mm -hmm. a pedestrian shed includes half a mile around your development, and it, the intent of that is to look at where can you live and access um, civic space and commercial space uh, by walking. Um, the, the goal is to create walkable neighborhoods um, where you can access a variety of services. Uh, and so... In that area, um, the civic or the convention center is across the street, which is actually civic space um, in those allocation calculations. So strictly speaking, there was not um, a heavy civic space requirement. So they are actually going above what is required here in this dedication. How many stories will the apartments be? Two and three. Yes, so speaking more to the architectural styles of the buildings themselves, um, they did read heavily into the authentic Bastrop pattern book, which as um, we know, mirrors, you know, did a study of downtown and the architectural styles present um, and are adhering to that as, as much as possible. Um, the pattern book requires streetscape diversity, meaning that not all the buildings can look the same. There must be variety in how those buildings are presented and how they look in their facades. Um, it also talks about corner treatment. So when you're on the corner of two streets, um, you don't want to have just one side of the building be you know, the primarily focused on side for interacting with the public realm. It, it requires you to um, address both um, streets. So in this case, even though the uh, streets are not publicly dedicated. They are still treating them as though they were in their treatment of the buildings. Um, and then the pattern book also requires that as you transition from residential homes into commercial, um, you, you mirror those styles so that even though the buildings get a little larger, you still have some consistency between what the homes look like and the, the more dense residential looks like before you get to the commercial. And so we have some architectural elevations here. Um, this is what it might look like from Chamber Street. Um, so these are the sides of a couple of the buildings, um, just based on how they're planning on orienting. And then one of the longer buildings could look like this. Do we have any um, information in terms of um, how it will be? Will it be gated? Will it be a fence, fencing? 
around it. Any, do we have any information on that? Um, not at this time, but I do know that the applicant is here and she may be able to speak to that um, in a moment. All right. So a zoning concept scheme does require a conceptual drainage plan. Um, they did submit one, it is approved. Uh, there are, you know, Gill's branches right there. We have extra um, detention, or not detention requirements, but um, stricter stormwater standards in the Gill's branch watershed. Um, and so they've run those preliminary numbers with the conceptual drainage plan and it does work. Uh, I thought it was worth noting that in the current P3 zoning, the impervious cover limit is 60%. In P4, it's 70%, but currently as proposed, it's about 22%. So to help the drainage work and to improve conditions, you know, we're going with a little bit more denser product than a single family home type, um, but that does allow for more pervious surface to maintain to help the drainage. Um, you know, and they, as I mentioned earlier, they are dedicating open space along Gill's Branch so that we have room for improvements there at a future date. Um, they will need to mitigate the floodplain um, and we will continue to review drainage um, during the subdivision planning and site development plan and public improvement plan stages um, as this moves forward. All right. And as they move forward, um, they are considering tax credits to uh, help fund the development. Um, so the city does need to provide consent to that. Uh, we would go through the subdivision planning process. We would have drainage plans, public improvement plans for the public improvements along chambers. Um, we would go through the site development plan for the development itself, certificates of appropriateness since we are in the Iridell Historic District, making sure that all of that meets the pattern book, um, and of course, building permits. So um, I remember that piece of property being a junkyard, right? Um, so with that being said, how long does the ground have to is there a test going to be done on the ground, you know, on, to see if there's any remnants left from all the cars that were there? Um, how long does it take for the soil to rejuvenate itself? Do we have information on that? We do not have information on that. Um, that is typically part of a development's due diligence on if uh, there are environmental concerns or hazards in the area and if there are uh, mitigation for those. Um, I do not have information at this time on that. Um, this might be a little bit early in the process for it. Yeah. This is just to take the temperature more or less to see if. Yeah, this is just to see is it. Something that we may want to have happen right. here. And where will the parking be for the residents of the apartments? Will it be on street? There will be, the primary parking will be on that parallel street to Chambers um, behind, between the creek and uh, the buildings. Okay. Uh, but there is also on-street parking on Chambers Street and on the three streets in between the two. Okay. On the private streets. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anything else? So I, I do have a question on the, uh, on the lots facing Farm Street and, and Cedar Street, um, mm -hmm. it would appear that those are kind of would catch in the side of the building. Is that correct? So those two are the flex space lots? Those are the two you're referring mm -hmm. to? And then the other one on the other is on Cedar yes. Street? Yes. Are those the sides of the building? Um, right now, nothing is proposed to be oh. placed on those two lots. That was just a rendition of where buildings could be placed. But when they do develop that, the, the, being that it's facing the street, they would have to face the street. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the one on Cedar Street um, per code would, would need to face Cedar Street. The one on Farm, since it would be a corner lot between Chambers and Farm, they would get to pick their frontage, but they would have to pick one and face that. Um, and since it's a corner lot, they'll need to abide by the, the corner lot standards. All of Farm Street, all those houses face Farm Street. Yes. Yes. Um, other question I have is, uh, so I'm counting about 19 buildings right now. What are the plans for the future? The plans for the future would be to develop it as 
as shown with those apartment buildings. Um, and then there will be a clubhouse proposed. Um, that's what the building closer to the creek is. Um, and then future amenity space. That may be a good question for the applicant as well. Will they have to show what the future build out will be at any point during this early process or is it, well, how does that go on the planning stage? So for the zoning concept scheme, um, this shows their intent for the development and it shows the, um, the regulation for how their neighborhood is intended to build out. Since those are private streets, not public streets, um, we, and our code deals more with how you interact with the public streets, right. um, this plan does meet those requirements. I, I think mm -hmm. that the Farm Street and yeah. uh, Cedar Street don't, but I think they need to face the street uh, down the road. Because um, I think, I'm looking at seven, uh, I'm looking at Farm Street and those definitely mm -hmm. look like they're facing in, uh, they're, okay. if they're facing Farm Street, then they're stacked. Right, those, those, those look the, like they're facing chambers, yeah. But I, oh, I do okay, not believe that yeah. those for buildings are proposed in this development, okay. in this phase. Um, and we're a long way from getting elevations and looking at what the buildings will right. actually be like. Is there a optionality for apartments on this property right now in a different configuration that wouldn't require a zoning change? What P3 allows is a single family house with two accessory dwelling units or a duplex with an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and that's per lot. So someone could come in with subdivision plans like the previous plats we mm -hmm. just saw, which were also about 15 acres. And um, subdivide the lot subdivide into. And put in, we don't have any lot minimum standards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you could come in with a very dense single family product as mm -hmm. it currently stands. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cynthia, you had a question? Yeah, uh, just going back a little bit on the uh, drainage and uh, flooding issues. I noticed a, a big concern of property owners is talking about the flooding on Gill's Branch. Can you back up a little bit and tell me more about how that's going to be remedied and so they don't have to be concerned about this because I'm a little confused about is what is the what's the situation right now? Okay, um, so Gills Branch, uh, since I mentioned earlier, it has stricter standards in the stormwater drainage manual, um, and that is because of studies that we've done and existing uh, shallow flooding in this area um, and all along Gills Branch, and so there are stricter standards there. So um, normally when you have a development, you detain to the 100-year storm. In this area, you have to detain the 100-year storm to the 25-year storm, which means you detain more, you handle your drainage more, you do not let as much run off. Um, while we have applied for grants for improving Gills Branch, um, you may have seen those in city council meetings, we do not have that funding at this time. Um, so this development will have to follow all of those standards and be aware of the floodplain and all of uh, the best available data. Um, and those will be used to inform their, they have a preliminary drainage plan and a uh, final drainage plan that they will need to make all of that work. They will not be allowed to discharge property off of this property um, after they develop it. Uh, we call it post-development flows, they cannot exceed their pre-development flows. Um, does that help? And it, regarding that also, um, because they are required on a P4 to have 70% um, impervious coverage, and we're taking this down to 22%. So they're allowed up they're to 70%. Allowed up, and they're yes. just going to have 22. So, so that's, as, as it is now, it's a, it's a they're really focusing their development on Chambers Street um, and allowing for more residents to live downtown in a walkable area uh, than say a single family product that's more spread out. And so they're allowing as much pervious cover 
um, to allow that water and drainage. They're giving themselves more opportunity to handle the drainage by having less footprint. More impervious cover means there'll be more concrete, yes. less ground. And, and more water runoff. And more water runoff. Yes. Yes. Did that answer your question, Cynthia? Okay, if the commission has no more questions, we will, this is a public hearing. I have one more question. Okay. Sorry. On this, Hurry up. Uh, uh, the, uh, it says public trail. Um, I guess that'll, what is that? I can go over that one more time. Uh, there is a proposed um, public pedestrian way in the middle of that development towards the creek. Um, eventually, the city would like to see a public trail go along Gills Branch, and so this would provide connectivity to okay. that, um, should that be funded. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Job, do you have anything to add? I see you sitting on the edge of your seat. <laughs> uh, I just want to talk about the drainage a little bit more. So actually by detaining to the 25-year storm, uh, currently the way it sits is a vacant lot, just grass, if, it, if we had a 100-year event, right? That would run off at 100 year worth of runoff just directly the way it is. They're going to contain to a, a smaller year storm. So they're actually shaving the peak that's running off. They're improving the drainage in the area quite a bit. So just to make that clear, by covering less of it, it's going to be in much better shape than it is today as it sits as a green field. So I just want to make sure we understood that. Okay, thank you. Sure. If there are no more questions, Ms. Land, do you have anything else to add? No, ma'am. I just wanted y'all to know the applicants here. Thank you. I have one one little question here. Um, there was a mention of parking on the street. Um, the, our streets are not very wide, um, so I was wondering, in terms of parking on the street, how would that impact traffic um, congestion? Are there um, considerations to possibly widen the street to accommodate that? But our streets are just not wide enough for that much apartment parking. Sure. So um, we do have adopted street cross sections. Um, and so that looks at the allocation of all of your different uses in the street right of way. Um, so that includes a travel lane, right? So your uh, typical vehicle travel lane. And this parking would be in addition to that, to the right. Um, and then to the right of that, you would have your sidewalk and your street trees. And so this would make sure that there is plenty of room. The parking would not eat into the travel lane. Um, you know, some of our older roads are a little narrower, um, but this would actually dedicate a full travel lane separate from the parking. Do any commissioners have any questions of the applicant? The applicant is here. Yes, yes. So. Um, I don't know if this is what it is not working right now. Um, yes, but we do have the, on the southern boundary there on Chambers Street, you'll have the public travel lane, the row of public parallel parking, public sidewalk, and street trees, and then you get into the property and the private drives. Does, well, I'm sorry, does that parking just be on one side? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is really just really and truly half the street. So it'll be one way um, and half the street. Yeah, one and, side. And we're just talking about Chamber Street, right? We're not Correct. talking about That's just Cedar Chamber or street. Farm. Right, right. just Chamber okay. I'll go. I did want to say that um, you know, I did look over the exterior elevations, and I, I do think this is a really good plan to keep it residential scale, residential looking, so it doesn't look, and I just I think that's a really good way to to see that we're seeing our process that we put out there mm -hmm. being being used and I think it's going to benefit Bastrop because of this we have a pattern book that they can look at we have uh, some building forms that they can follow and the residential scale and residential nature of this even though it is multifamily won't look like your large scale apartment buildings that are right. much out of scale I would think in many ways so I thought that's a really good really good use of what we put in place, and I think it's the first time I've seen something like this from a project, so that's really good. Cynthia? 
since uh, traffic is going to be greatly increased on farm and cedar, and we have a, a school and a convention center and other businesses that also feed onto those streets, are there any improvements, any changes on farm and street or cedar that will help the neighborhood? Um, farm and cedar are actually relatively built out newer streets, um, so there are no, no proposed changes to those at this time. Um, I will say the gridded network and the multiple driveways does help disperse that traffic more than just a single point of entry would. You know, a lot of times in a multifamily development, you have, you know, one main point of entry and maybe an extra um, exit out. And so this design with the building blocks does help to disperse that traffic. Um, and with Chamber Street going towards Cedar, um, that should help get traffic out um, of the more residential area and dispersed onto the highway um, and other streets there. So to just to kind of, I, I would, I hope that that's really taken into consideration, like mm -hmm. in depth, because in the morning times or afternoons, like traffic can be all the way to 95 on Farm Street, and over at the high school, mm -hmm. it's a whirlwind of everything. So just to go off of what Cynthia said as well, just I hope that's taken into strong consideration. Well, just to mention that, uh, can I see that because of the the, the private driveways here, right, that's acting as the street and the drive aisles, this being the only public road. Um, it does mimic the activity, but that's why we talked about they wanted pedestrian access, not public, um, which is something we mentioned early on. It just doesn't work well for their financing. Um, I will say that it's probably going to more than likely be used like a street, if I had to guess. Um, but Alice is absolutely correct. The, Part of the stacking that happens on Cedar and on farms because they're all trying to get to 95 because right. that's the only way to pull out. This is going to help. People that have to go a different direction are going to cut through Chambers now. Now Chambers is going to have some traffic, I, I don't doubt it, for that couple hour windows in the morning, a couple hour window in the afternoon. I picked up a kid there every day for years. It's miserable. I don't disagree. <laughs> um, I have also talked to the school about a traffic plan for all of their campuses. We're kind of working through that now just so you know. Um, because that is truly the impact on the area is the school. Um, but since we're not dedicating publicly uh, public streets, there's actually a TIA requirement comes with that. So what we have as a standard is if you that. follow the grid, no TIA requirement. <coughs> They're going to need to show us what their impact is. And if there is improvements needed, that'll speak to that in the, the TIA. So hope that answers that question. would come down the road a little. That at happens at the, at the subdivision piece, right? right? This is just the zone. This it's is very good. high level. What do you think? Does this fit the neighborhood? And then we get into that real detail before you see the final plan. A lot more T's to cross and I's to dot yes, in, in discussions and more meetings and more public comment. So. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. And so if, as we were talking about earlier, let's, let's say that we didn't allow this development and someone came in, or these applicants or somebody else came in and wanted to subdivide this into a bunch of different parcels let's say they put up three-story duplexes as dense as they can, you wouldn't need a TIA if you did that lot by lot. So, I mean, there's scenarios where you could have more traffic and more drainage impact than yes. what is being proposed here. Yes, that's absolutely. A, that's a, a scenario. So what you're talking about is individual lots being uh, developed, not a developer coming in. Mm -hmm. And that would not require a, tra a TIA is a traffic mm. impact analysis. Right. They could just subdivide this and sell it off. Sell it off lot by with lot. With plans and have a, a greater, right. uh, up to 60%, yeah, yeah greater, greater impervious cover and, and yeah. potentially similar traffic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Another question. Um, it, and I... I Making this more walkable, and, and uh, what about any? Is there any thought about transportation? You know, and connecting it in some way to uh, what is what is the city thinking long term for a public transportation of any kind? Or is there stops planned for this? No. Well, it's kind of premature right now to talk yeah, about stops before we've got people yeah, in there. Could be. I mean, um, if carts. The carts is usually carts does, is expanding. Right, carts is expanding. Uh, they operate the regional bus and the. Um, 
their little electric taxis. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure if there were demand, you know, they could work on their routes. But it's a little early in the process. With this for being that. a multifamily and mm -hmm. uh, a, a more dense development, you know, I think that would be a prime location to be mm -hmm. baked into the, the plan. You could just yeah. keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah, we could absolutely talk to Carts about that. Mayor Pro Tim Nelson, who is um, one of the big guys over at Carts, may want to speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Council just, Member. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just real quick, CARS no longer operates at just a fixed route system. They operate what's called on demand. It's at base, so you don't have to put stops. So it's curb to curb, stop to stop type program. And certainly, the, the, any type of housing development that went in there would be uh, uh, that service would be available to them. So it's it's the bus stops are becoming passe into into the, today's new transit wor world. So it's uh it's it's going to be something where access to public transportation will be optimal. That help? Thank you, sir. Yes. Now, one more time. Does the, com do the commissioners have any more questions? If not, I will open the public hearing at this time, and we will take comments from citizens who have signed up to speak before the meeting started. All right, first person I have here is Sonia. Is that my old landlord? Hey, Sonia. Sonia Mallet. Hi. Hi there. I, um, I don't like talking at these things, but there were a couple of comments I wanted to make. Um, remember that flood that flooded all of downtown Bastrop? What was that, 2016? Am I getting the I feel like it was 2016 because I. There would have been more than one. <laughs> well, no, it was the one that came down. What, what I wanted to point out is that is not a 100-year flood plain. That's a 100-year flood way, which means all the water comes down there, and it crosses here, goes down Hazel, Pine Street. It flooded all of that. So everybody blamed it on Bucky's, and I don't know enough to argue, <laughs> but that's where the water came from. And so um, that's the concern, is I have watched during the heavy rains the water run down Cedar. Um, the other thing is um, traffic. I don't know. I, I know somebody mentioned that they came and picked up their kids. I think, I think you did. It is a nightmare, and I can't even think of adding, I mean, how many parking spaces are for this proposed complex? No, but how many parking spots? 165 on their property or on our streets? So 165, and I already have high school kids parking in my property to get parking spaces. So I'm just saying there's a lot of very heavy traffic and it's high school kids running across there going to the performing arts center and parents waiting on the side of the road while buses go by so it's i i would really encourage more of a look of what um, the busiest time is um the width of the road was a concern i know that they've already redone the roads i don't remember seven years ago ten years ago <laughs> um but this I mean, seriously, the school is super busy there. Um, if we are funneling traffic back on 95 there, you know what 95's like between Bucky's and the high school. It is crazy. You know, you've got Loop 150. It's just really, really busy there. Um, and I don't think 165 spaces is going to be enough for 120 units that may have two roommates or well we're not to, we're not to that point okay. yet this is just a concept sure. to see if the city is interested and the commission is interested in seeing this development me there <laughs> but there'll be a lot sure. more time and a lot more meetings so we can get down to specificities as far as parking and and traffic impact analyses and the like so okay um so like i said i i 
I'm not a, opposed to development. I don't always want that to be a farm lot. I know that's not very practical, but I don't think it's likely to have as much development if it goes single family or even duplex. I really don't mind duplex. I, I'm just, 120 makes my head explode because I walk that property where I used to back when it was uh, years ago. So I, it's not that big and I know the way the water sheds. And if you've got a floodway, that's gonna, that part of that lot filters. I haven't seen the new flood maps. I don't know if that's changed. I know that's next week's meeting. <laughs> Um, but those are, you know, some of my concerns as we've had properties flood on Hazel and Pine and Water Street. I need to interrupt you because sure. I should have told you you had three minutes. Okay. I, think, <laughs> I think that's it. I just wanted to mention this. Okay. Time. Thank you. Appreciate it. We haven't had a public hearing in a while. I'm out of practice. Okay. The next person signed up is Morris Mock. And you will have three minutes, sir. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Sure. Yeah, I, um, I own property <clears throat> off of 95, and um, it, it obviously would border this. And I've owned it for quite a number of years, and I have seen the floods that go down Gill's Branch. And I just think that if we increase the non-pervious area, that we're going to add more flooding issues to Gill's Branch. Uh, in the presentation, it sounded as though they were gonna have a walking trail along Gill's Branch, which is kind of news to me because my property actually is on both sides of Gill's Branch. So uh, I don't know, I haven't been contacted by anyone about uh, have putting a walking trail on it, uh, but my property off of 95 crosses over Gill's Branch. I think the parking issue is going to be a really, really big issue. As a former owner of a, a small apartment complex, I realized soon that although all of my apartments were one bedroom uh, and there was only, only 12 of them, I had as many as 25 parking spaces required of those apartments. You, and then people will park wherever <laughs> they find a spot and it's not going to necessarily be pretty um, if if we don't have enough parking spots and uh, I think the traffic issue as, as, as has been brought up I think that'll be a, a, a really big concern I think highway 95 getting on and off highway 95 that'll probably require a red light both on Cedar and on uh, on Farm Street because it's going to be a real heavy traffic con congested area. And as far as the um, being able to walk to downtown, um, I have a renter in my property off of 95, which is right there. They would never think about walking to downtown. They're going to have to have a car or they're going to have to have some kind of vehicle or maybe take public transportation. But I just don't see where this is a good fit for such a concentrated um, um, dense population to be living in that area, uh, particularly between uh, the uh, convention center and Wilhelm over on the north side. I guess it's north. So I think that's all I have. Thank Thanks, you. sir. You still had 22 seconds to go. All righty. <laughs> you can dance for me. There you go. Okay, the next is Charles Hugh. Yes, sir. Good evening. And Mr. Huth lives at 1303 Cedar Street. I'm sorry? And you live at 1303 Cedar Street. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Sorry, I didn't put my hearing aid in. <laughs> That's okay. Our neighborhood is only unique in that we and our neighbors consider it so. 65 years ago when my grandmother's pipes froze, it was a neighbor from across the street who carried two gallons of water over to her. She had gotten that water from the only source of water she had, a standpipe with a hose bib in her yard. When we had the big freezing snow cover this year, it wasn't the school district who checked on us. It was our neighbors down the street on the other side of the school. 
When Billy Reed, recently deceased, heard that both my wife and I would, would not be home because we both worked during the day, but our school-aged daughter would be home, he made sure that she had his phone number close at hand. Apartment complexes can sometimes be necessary. They have, we're sure, some very nice people in them. But for the life of me, I cannot contemplate that they are the kind of neighbors I just described. Folks here tonight will speak of increased vehicular and pedestrian traffic on already too narrow roads. They will speak about noise and light pollution, but I wanna talk about neighbors. When we spoke to the city council 26 years ago about building a house on our land, they assured us that Bastrop needed more single family dwellings and welcomed us. My great grandfather built his house in about 1870 where the pack parking lot is. My grandfather and his brother built houses on Fayette Street adjacent to our house. We want good neighbors and we want to be good neighbors. Neighbors have been mentioned from biblical times to the present, but we want neighbors, not statistics. Thank you. Please, no applause. Daniel Smith, 1504 Cedar, correct? Correct. Okay, you have three minutes, sir. My name is Daniel Smith. I'm here with my wife, Linda Smith and we live on 1504 Cedar Street. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to y'all. I'm here with my friends, neighbors, and we live on Cedar Street, Farm Street, and Chamber Streets. We are here to discuss this proposed zoning and apartments. I am totally opposed to this uh, P3 to P4 in a building 120 apartment units. My wife and her family have been living on 1504 on property for over 79 years and it's not really good, we go out and we have to see apartment complex facing us. I don't know, we already discussed this about the traffic. Traffic on, 79, on Highway 95 and Cedar Street on 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning and 4.15 to 4.45 p.m., it is stacked. And we can't even get up our driveway. And now if you get that exit coming from those apartment complexes, we're looking maybe a 50 to 100 cars coming there. I'll never get out of my driveway. These apartments, if the apartments were gonna be built, we're gonna have problems with uh, damage to our streets and possibly damage to structures. And I know about something about heavy trucks because I used to be a highway patrolman. I weigh these trucks. I've seen the damage these do to our streets and our fixtures and there's gonna be some damage. I already had damage a dump truck coming on my driveway and cracking it. And now with this apartment complex being built, there might be some more. My wife and I are just tired of cleaning up beer cans, hamburger wrappers, and cigarette butts around our house due to the school. And now with this apartment complex being built and people coming out, we'll probably get more. And I'm glad uh, Commissioner Harris brought up something about the, about the, the area of being a flood zone, uh, it's a junkyard and it's also possibly, a, it's like a swimming pool. After that hurricane, that water was high. I don't know how they're gonna fix that. Most important, what I'm upset about, this has been going on for a couple of weeks or months. We get this letter within two weeks. This is going way too fast. This needs to be slowing down. And also something they need to discuss is about the habitat. There is lots of deer out there, and there's some fox and armadillos, and I know about that because they come into my yard occasionally. I have to run them out. In conclusion, we've been living here, our neighbors, for a long, extended time. We like and care for our neighborhood. We don't want to see this particular change. The developers just want to build these apartments, and then they'll be going at the next development. Again, thank you for y'all's time. Thank you, sir. Lindy Larson, 1320 Farm, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, welcome. I've marked through most of my speech because I didn't think I needed to say it, but the first thing I wanna do is tell you where I live. 
I live at 1320 Farm Street, directly across from the conference center. My house was built in 1890. It's been in my family for 43 years, and a history with that house goes back to the 40s, so that would be about 70 somewhat years. I want to talk about Chamber Street because nobody is really getting the impact of what this will do to Chamber Street. Chamber Street runs off a of farm. My house is farm and chambers. I've heard farm a lot. I've heard chambers a lot. I mean, uh, cedar a lot, and those are important. But chambers is going to be devastated by this because they're putting three exits on chambers to go down to cedar. They're putting an enter. It's a one-way with parallel parking all the way down. Then they're putting a, an enter on farm, off farm onto chambers. So you've got an enter on farm, one way all the way down, three exits out of that apartment complex. And I'm right there in the corner. I have a half an acre with my house. It's on the National Historic Register of Historic Places. And many other houses are on that street in that neighborhood. That should be zoned a historical neighborhood. There's a house right now, right down the road from me that's being restored that was built in 1870, 1895. I mean, they're, they're old, they're all old and they're all beautiful. And this apartment development is going to, to devastate. It's a hog. It's gonna devastate that community. But Chambers Street, I own the house that's close to the street. All the way down Chambers Street, there's another neighbor that faces Chambers Street, Ms. Hoskins. So my property goes about a half an acre all the way down. That's how much of my property, my house, my half an acre, I'm gonna be able to look over and see this concrete jungle. I don't care how pretty they make the houses. It's gonna be a, a, a light nightmare, a pollution nightmare. The parallel parking down Chamber Street, that's for the overflow. They've got 165 apart, uh, parking spaces. They've got 121 two and three bedroom apartments going in there. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of cars. I sat on my front porch this morning and had my morning coffee from seven to eight and counted how many cars go down the school. There's at least 70 cars lined up to drop children off. And in the afternoon, we've got people coming through the conference center to drop kids off, coming through the conference center to go down to 95. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Appreciate your concern. It Thank you for be, taking the time it's not to come. A, it's not a P4 mix. This is a P5 core zoning development, period. Thank you, ma'am. Sandra Andre. Sandra is a developer, and she wishes to speak to us tonight. You have three minutes. Hi. Tonight. Good evening, and forgive me for correcting you, it's Sarah Andre, but people do that all the time. I think my handwriting could use a little work. You have an accent there, so. Oh, yeah, I thought you said Sandre was my name. It's Sarah. Sarah Andre. <laughs> yes, okay, sorry. I'm from South Louisiana. Uh, yeah. I know them I, Andres. I get that all the time, <laughs> so I probably could have written it a little more clearly. Um, I just wanted to address a few of the questions that I heard tonight from you all. Um, this is a great hearing, and the team at the city has been um, great to work with. They very much want to carry out the new code and have, you know, brought us back over and over to do things that reflect the code, some of which I'm hearing some pushback on from, you know, residents tonight. So. I think sometimes there's a little bit of con conflict between the code and, you know, the style of development that's required and maybe, um, you know, putting in a new street and having parallel parking on it, things like that can be kind of upsetting. They're, they're big changes. So I do understand that. Um, I think, Commissioner Harris, you asked about environmental impacts and we have had an environmental site assessment, a phase one. It did not find anything that um, needed further investigation. If we 
obtain another phase one, which we will do for our funding sources, and it requires a phase two, we will have that phase two, and then typically anything that is found in a phase two is required to be remediated with proof and documentation from remediation specialists by our funding sources. So we would not leave anything, nor would we develop on a site that was unfit for that. I've also heard um, a little bit, someone asked a question, I believe Commissioner Lee, about whether or not this would be gated. That is absolutely up in the air. I don't think the code really calls for a gate. One of the ideas is to keep new development connected to the fabric of the old development, and so that's why we designed this where pedestrians could walk from chambers down the middle of the site, down to the creek, and you know, yes, there is a line showing a trail along the creek. I believe that is a future plan of the city. Um, you know, and we of course want to provide access to our residents for that as well as any other residents. I heard some concerns about traffic and parking. I think those are, traffic in particular is very real. I come down 95 to get to the site and I also have to make a left onto farm or to cedar and I understand what people are talking about. Um, it's, you know, can be a little, um, I'd say scary, but I'm, I'm kind of a timid driver anyway. One thing I really like about this site is that if you live there and you have school age kids, you can walk. You don't have to get in your car to drive to the elementary school or the high school. I'm sorry. Thank you for your time and let me know if you have any additional questions. Thank you. At this time, I will close the public hearing. Any commissioners have any further comments? If not, I'll... I do. Go for it. Okay, so I was, I was just kind of making some notes here. I think that uh, any development that does happen will have to meet the strictest drainage development guidelines around this area. We, you may recall, uh, City of Bastrop shut down development for about a year so that they could fix that. And so we are way on top of that. So I, I feel really confident that what's being proposed will not slide. It'll, it'll have to meet every bit of that guidance. That, that the city has, uh, I think that's gonna be addressed. I do think that traffic will be an issue. And I know, I think we all know that, uh, Bastrop is growing. And one of the whole, I've been part of uh, planning and zoning for a while, and I got, in, I got involved. I actually live very close to where this is at. I'm on Hill Street. And I know Mina is just, in the morning, I have trouble getting out myself. But one of the reasons I got involved with planning and zoning is because I wanted to be able to help you know, get this done right. Uh, my background is as an architect and I've seen some things go really wrong. I can tell you as a development, this is a really good development uh, as far as the residential scale. Um, you just can't get away from the fact that we're gonna be growing. We're a growing city. Uh, someone brought up that this could be subdivided in a bunch of different ways. Traffic will always be an issue. How we do that, I think trying to address it and think about it in a holistic way across the whole site is a good thing. Uh, the walkability of Bastrop is probably the best thing we have going for us. So to me, that's the biggest thing we have, and this meets that. I really am glad to see that we're thinking about those things. But um, yeah, traffic, uh, we have things down for lighting, for sound control. I mean, for, it's all going to be a nuisance-based kind of way to handle that. That from a historic perspective, it'll have to obtain a certificate of appropriateness from the Historic Landmark Commission. So they're gonna to have to jump through a lot of hoops. At this early stage, I think that what they're trying to show us is what could happen in this scenario. And to stay authentic, Bastrop, that, that is it right there. That's what authentic Bastrop is trying to do. But um, you know, I wanna hear what everyone else has to say. I just have a question about the drainage. Um, you know, because of the 2015 flooding, I know that the city has um, made some upgrades and improvements there. Can we be reminded of what those improvements were um, to ac accommodate the, uh, that would help accommodate any flooding, or sure. possible flooding um, in that area? Yeah, so what, it's nice to finally be taller than the mic once in my life. So um, yeah, actually the, the drainage standards are what changed the most, right? So the rainfall totals were, for example, I think they were peaked out in the 100 year storm was somewhere in our records about um, eight inches per hour, for example. 
Now they're using Atlas 14 data, which is 14. So it's been an increase. Uh, it, it, what that does by making stricter regulations, it makes your bonds bigger. It makes them, uh, your, your infrastructure a little larger to handle that bigger rain. Because this is in the Gills Branch area, and it talks about that in the development manual, you actually have to retain to an average storm. So just to give you an example, they call it the 1% storm or the 100-year storm. Uh, they stopped calling it the 100-year storm because everybody says, hey, we had two in less than 100 years. So, to, 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 so that's a 1% chance that you're going to hit that flood. A 2% chance um, is your 25. And then you've got just a standard storm, which is a two-year rain or something like that is what they call it. So your average, and maybe I'm not making any sense, I don't know. But the, because of the stricter regulations, that requires them to have larger detention on this site that shaves the peak of runoff. So if it rains right now, hits the ground, it's going to run off at the rate that it always does. It's actually going to run off at less because of the improvements. So they're improving the area. Um, what we've also talked about, and this is where I think the trail conversation came in, there is no plan for a Okay, show us where the detention pond's going to be. I believe it's right here. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So everybody can see that. I don't, not only that, the city has designed 100% set of plans for improvements along Gills Branch. So in that 2015-2016 era um, of when we had these floods, a lot of people came to City Hall. They wanted something done. We designed a plan. We applied for a grant. We just found out three months ago we did not receive the grant funding. So there will have to be, there'll be another opportunity to fund that later on. We're actually going to apply for a couple more grants. And this is probably, if we don't receive the grants, I would say we'd likely do it in some type of bond issuance to make those improvements. Um, all of the property owners up and down the Gills Branch were contacted so we could survey, so we could do the, the drainage study, so we could design the plans. Um, what we didn't do because we didn't receive the grant is move into that next phase, which would be property acquisition and starting to talk to folks and showing them plans and things of that nature. But it's 100% designed and ready to go as soon as you find that funding um, we should be in pretty good shape. The real issue uh, from 2015, and, and I know we've I heard we blamed it on Bucky's, which could be some of that, but the real issue was the railroad. The railroad is our big barrier. That is a dam that splits right down the middle of town, pretty much, right? So that was truly the cause. And what happened is Gills Branch, as it flows towards the river, it actually turns back east as well. So I'm sorry, west. So when it gets full, it runs west, hits the railroad tracks, and then runs back. And that's what happened while Fayette was flooded. It was so bad in this area. The detention they're proposing is actually going to lessen that runoff, if that helps. Can that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cynthia? Trey, um, so we don't have the funding for the improvements. We'll keep trying to get that. So my concern is shouldn't we have the funding and make the improvements first before we change any place types from residential to mixed use? So, so what the law requires us to do is if someone want, wants to develop their property, they cannot discharge more water than they currently are discharging now, right? They've actually lessened that. So they've met all the requirements of state law. Um, would it be nice if the, ten, if the improvements were there first? Absolutely. Uh, but it's, we can't require that. That's the problem. Trey, I've got a question. Sure. So you're going to require a traffic impact analysis for this property? Correct. Let's say that that traffic impact analysis comes back and it, it shows problems. Is there going to be uh, comments that the city issues to the applicant that requires them to reduce the number of units or something like that? Or how, how would that, would it, would there, they have to put more parking or reduce their units or both? So what we required is, is upgrades to the, to the intersections, like you said, chambers, um, to uh, Cedar, to farm. Uh, generally, they make sure that you make sure these intersections work. Right, so not necessarily saying, hey, you can't have more units or less units. It's just, here's your traffic impact. Here's how you mitigate it. And you have to pay your percentage. And your percentage could be, so let's remember, there's a whole lot of people using, right, that's using Cedar and that's using Farm. It's not mm -hmm. just these 120 apartments. So sure. they would have a percentage of those improvements. And that's all we can ask for. And do you have, what's the, what's the parking space requirement, like per LUE or per air conditioned square foot? Do you have... So we don't have a parking requirement um, okay. in the B3 codes. We, we eliminated that, but we tell you is where you can park on your lot. So you can park in that third layer or that second layer. And that's what you see there. Their, their parking for their site is in the rear, which is the third layer of the lot. So you've got your 
from the public right away to the front of the building is your first layer. You've got 20 foot past the building, which is your second, and then the third is behind that. And so they're required where they park on the lot, not how many. So they could lessen or, or have more even. But again, that impacts the drainage, which is why that's where we always start is with drainage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely have some concerns about the number of spaces per, you know, allocated for total number of units. I think that's a, a legitimate concern that people are, people are bringing up. But I tend to agree with Pablo that in general, this, the style of this fits what we're going for. It, it, it looks cohesive with the neighborhood. And I would be fearful of somebody else coming in and putting up something that, yeah, maybe meets the code, but maybe it's, pardon my French, maybe they come in and put up crap or right. maybe they overbuilt something and they aren't putting in these buffers for drainage that, you know, that doesn't have walkability or doesn't have sure. the, this additional green space that's allocated. And that, I mean, that's a, that's a real possibility for, you know, for you all who are neighbors down there is to get, is to get something that's less desirable than from what we're looking at. Right. Even if, and you're, you're bringing up some good points, but even if, if this were to develop into different blocks, right, as it's shown now, um, and these were public streets, Chamber Street would still be required to be built, right? Chamber Street would be built, this road, wherever you want to name them, these would all still be required, and you would end up with single family dwellings that still face the street, so you're absolutely right. You're, you're gonna have a neighbor no matter what. It's just a matter of, of the connectivity and how it works. Um, Chamber Street's gonna be there um, regardless. And, uh, and it, Looking at this holistically, uh, Commissioner Cerna brought up, it, it actually is a good idea to have connectivity all the way across. This Chamber Street is, is, is needed in my mind um, to actually help reduce some of this. Because some folks are leaving to 95 because that's how they get home. Others, if you're local, you're gonna take Chambers now. And it's gonna split the traffic and make less traffic impact, less queuing, less stacking. We know that that works. You can always move over one block. Um, it's super efficient. That's why we put it, that's why we did it that way. Um, it makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And what we're here for tonight is to decide whether or not to recommend this concept plan to the city council. So at this time, I'll entertain a motion, yay or nay. I make a motion to uh, approve the plan as is and to uh, continue. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. We call the roll. Pablo Cerna? Yes. Carrie Kaler? Yes. Debbie Moore? Yes. Cynthia Meyer? No. Cheryl Lee? I'm going to say yes. Ishmael Harris? No. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to item four workshop. Item 4A, discussion on, before we move on, let me once again say that this is approving a concept, recommending approval of a concept plan. There'll be a lot more meetings, there'll be a lot more discussion, and there'll be a lot more requirements put on these folks if it does move down the line. So this is not saying that it's gonna be built tomorrow. So we appreciate you coming. That's what makes things work, is that when neighbors and citizens get involved. So please stay tuned and come back again. So thank you very much. The item number four, workshop for a discussion on timeshares and form-based versus use-based or ownership-based regulations. All right. Ms. Allison. Yes. So this item was put on the agenda at the request of um, Commissioner Cerna. Um, and so we just briefly put together some basics for you all. Um, Timeshares are a ownership, they are a property ownership model. Um, it is not a, it doesn't change the use of a property um, and it doesn't change the form of a property. So even if you have a, um, usually you see timeshares as, as condo type developments, but um, increasingly in recent uh, years with different, um, you know, just everything that's changing in the world. Uh, we have seen a slight trend towards timeshares being used for smaller 
um, residential products. Um, so I think we found a, an article using that for residential homes, single family homes. Um, I mean, our code does not regulate that is, is the short end of it. Um, at the end of the day, we regulate, you know, how that house fronts the street, how it interacts with the street. Um, we do not regulate how it's owned. You know, you could own it, um, a family could own it, a property management company could own it, um, and people will live there and use it as a house, and our code says that's okay. Um, there are some uh, international residential code and international building code standards that do get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty on um, how many people per bedroom, how many bedrooms is the house, and you start to trigger different uses within the building code and different requirements um, once you reach what it calls lodging. Um, so once you start to exceed uh, people who are not staying there, you know, transient populations who aren't staying there for 30 days or more at a time, um, or once you have, um, I think our building code said it was about 16 people, um, once you start having more than your two people per, your standard two people per bedroom, uh, you start to trigger additional requirements of the building code. Um, and then once you are that dense and that populated, and if you're not owner occupied, uh, then you start to change into more of a commercial use, into a lodging use, um, which is not allowed in our P3 neighborhood districts. They would need to go to P4 at that point because they are doing lodging more in line with the come and go population. And so that's. Thank you. So people learn explanation. So I did come across an article. This was happening in, um, mm -hmm. of course, I think it's California, California. but it's, it's coming our way at some point. Um, as we start to go through development, and I think we know that this area, particularly the downtown area, is the most fiscally sustainable area. Mm -hmm. We think I saw some chart, I don't know how high it is, but it's really well. So um, developers see that and, and people, and they'll just buy them up. I know uh, a lot of people are buying up different lots in Austin that don't live in Austin. And if you can't afford to buy something like that, well, what they're doing is they're forming LLCs and they're buying them, and you're just buying a percentage of that LLC to buy that historic lot, for example. And it's essentially a timeshare, but it's not because it doesn't look like a timeshare. It's an LLC purchasing a property. And uh, so what some towns are doing to get ahead of that is they're thinking about, do they really want to have a neighborhood where the families or the people that live there are really living there, or is it really just a timeshare? So I'm just putting it on the table. Um, we're way far away from that, but I can see Bastrop down the road becoming very desirable as we start to make some really good things like, like what we're doing tonight happen. And I, I can foresee LLCs coming in and snapping up property mm -hmm. and developing, and then it's a timeshare. And the neighborhood, the fabric of the neighborhood may not be that, what we think it is. So that's all, I was just putting that out there early on. Would this, oh, Go ahead. Sorry. Would this include like VRBO and Stuff like that. Airbnb. Uh, I mean, I know some of that's regulated by a... Vacation rental by owner. Mm -hmm. yeah, so but, it, but it's essentially mm -hmm. a similar scenario. And, and then to some of the larger properties that we've seen sell recently here, mm -hmm. that would be perfect for an LLC to come in and mm -hmm. group up. Yeah, I, I, and I'm not... I'm familiar with uh, time... Well, I'm sorry, the, you know, the, like the... Airbnb and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a still a single owner that yeah. buys a property and there's just income property for them. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it's in that vein. I guess I was just, because that can be regulated, like some cities will only allow a certain percentage of um, short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. So they don't have short-term rentals during ACL and everybody on the street yep. is renting out their house to people from all over the world. Yep. So they'll say only a street can have maybe a percentage, 20, 30%. Yep. So that's how that's controlled. But you can't control how people buy homes. Uh, and if an LLC and they just buy them all up, mm -hmm. now they can control how that happens and who shares that. So I don't know, it's a unique, mm -hmm. I heard about it and I thought I'd just bring it up. I, I saw it happening. I went up to Bozeman, Montana last year, and Bozeman's a really cute, quaint town, not a little bit bigger than Bastrop, but similar. Really cute, historic downtown, cute shops, and they're, they've been ravaged by this, where, where regular folks just can't afford their own town anymore. 
and they're really getting priced out and it's people in other states buying the house, renting it out three months out of the year, staying during the summer when it's nice and warm and then they're out of there when it's, you know, 30 below. So it, I think this is really apropos. We need to try to figure something out. I agree and I think we should do it sooner than later because it's coming is not way down the road. It's right here, mm -hmm. just right outside of us. So I think it's a great suggestion. I think it's good to address, and I think we should get on it as fast as we can. Yeah, I would say maybe um, if, if planning or the city can look into seeing what other towns are doing, because the, I guess what's at stake here is the heart of Bastrop is the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, people move to Bastrop because they love the little small town, Texas town. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd like to see that preserved in some way. I'm not saying we can't have a few uh, Airbnbs. I'm just saying we can't have 100% Airbnb. Right. Yes, yeah. so and we we actually have a staff member on a um, coalition with other cities for short-term rentals um, in general, not specifically to timeshares. Um, and how most cities regulate it is through a use-based zoning district and requiring special use permits and that sort of thing. Since we got away from that method of management, yeah. we will definitely have to get creative and do something unique because we do regulate by, by form more than, um, more than by use. Um, so, And that's been we'll our mantra get... since mm -hmm. the new codes came in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to keep an eye out and see what's happening. Yes, but we, we are definitely um, interacting with that coalition and, and working with other cities and seeing what the different, um, you know, the challenges that those cities are facing and thinking about how we can mitigate that within the framework of, of our development codes. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Pablo. Commission, just to let y'all know, I'm, so I am on the coalition and we have meetings with Fredericksburg, Galveston, and we're, we're watching and we're listening to learn right now. So it is on the radar. Um, it was even, the coalition was actually introduced to us by our city manager, Paul Hoffman. He's the one that extended the invite. So we, we hear you and we care and we, we're seeing what we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Gary, you have no question. Okay. All righty. Updates. 5A, update on recent city council actions regarding planning department items. All right. Um, I believe the only action items the planning department has had on council agendas are public improvement plan agreements, um, and those have passed. <laughs> so those, are, those were fiscal agreements for um, Bastrop Grove, whose plat you approved earlier, they've posted fiscal. Um, and I wanna say some stormwater infrastructure. Um, but that's about it. Anything else? Uh, 5B, individual requests from planning and zoning commissioners that particular items to be listed on future agendas. I, I'm gonna bring up again, I know we've talked about it before, but I'm, we keep approving these plats right on 969 and I'm worried about that corridor. I just noticed mm -hmm. on one of these a commercial um, lot on the end of uh, the colony there and I think it's important that we look at signage and lighting that's on that within our ETJ corridor there, the part that we can control as, we hear you. Sooner, as soon as possible. <laughs> yes. And 304. Yeah, and 304. Mm -hmm. Yep, all, all those keeping that corridor beautiful. Right. Then we'll have a discussion about that next month, okay? We can talk about where we are on it and our list of priorities. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Carrie. Anything else? Item 5C, Building Department, Planning Department, Monthly Projects, Volume Report. Yes. All right, so. Um, we are looking at, on the building side of things, 196 permits. Um, they are slightly down from, from last month, but um, they are still moving right along. Um, on the planning side of things, we've had 36 applications, um, and you can kind of see week by week um, how things are moving. Uh, planning side has actually been on a lull for submissions the last three weeks. Uh, so those numbers are, and people are starting to come back from summer vacations and 
and other things. Uh, so those numbers will probably go up next month. Um, and building permits, those are still moving along. Those follow our plats. So we just approved two plats on the city limits. So building permits will follow once they get all of their infrastructure installed. Do y'all have any questions on the permit report? Thank you. I need to correct an omission that I made. I did not see these that had comments that had come in beforehand um, regarding the apartment complex. Um, we got a letter from Catherine and Larry Albers in opposition. We have a comment form from Ruth Emanuel, opposed. James and Christy Foreman with statements, cannot, Farm Street cannot handle the extra traffic from this project. Farm Street has heavy traffic because of MENA already and heavy because of the theater and family dollar. Another comment from Sherry Lynn Hoskins, opposed. Patrick Jackney, opposed. Oh, I'm sorry, a fa in favor. He lives on Farm Street. Um, John and Melinda Larson, they are uh, opposed. And applicant and from Robert Miller, opposed. And Mildred Namkin, opposed. And Linda Smith, opposed. I do apologize. This was in a different stack of papers and I did not see that, but I wanted that read into the record so we'd know that they did send in comment forms. Okay, anything else, folks? If not, I so. have a quick question. Okay. Uh, um, are we done with discussions on the comprehensive plan or where are we on that? Um, I believe we have finished all of our chapter reviews. Um, and so we will be using that to form the scope of work for the actual update. And so we'll, while we prepare that, you'll have a break from it. Um, and then we will reintroduce it once we get to the actual update portion. And when Jennifer gets back too, we'll yes. work on that. <laughs> Cynthia? I was just going to see if you want to move on to item six. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I make a motion to adjourn. I second. Motion and second. In favor? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.